show you uh, in the history of theology concerning the idea of community and how if you take these ideas what problems can come in for you uh, if you're doing theology uh, and if you're defending the faith. So I recommend this book as a starter, uh, A New Systematic Theology by Dr. L. Robert L. Raymond. I, I'd encourage all the apologists at Hyde Park to get a copy of this book and to study it together, uh, to work on it and study it, rather than reject what I'm saying on the nature of scripture, how we define scripture, not by community, but by scripture. I would encourage you to get hold of this book on that particular issue, Dr. Robert L. Raymond, uh, by, published by Nelson. And anybody who wants to do serious apologetics, serious academic theology, um, I would encourage you to, before you start in your MA or your PhD, uh, before you start and launch into an apologetic career as an apologist, uh, you would read this book and get yourself uh, a grounding in theology. And in this book, there are a number of chapters on the nature of Scripture that will really help you. And then another book that I would encourage you on this issue of the nature of Scripture is Studies in Theology by Lorraine Botner. And uh, he writes, he writes, uh, uh, so I would encourage you to get hold of Lorraine uh, Botner, um, published by Erdman's Studies in Theology. Any, any serious student who's doing a, a degree in theology, who's doing uh, an MA in theology or a PhD in theology, needs to get hold of this book and read Botner's um, essays on the nature of scripture. Okay? You need to get hold of this book and read his essays on the nature of scripture. And anybody doing apologetics <coughs> at Hyde Park needs to get hold of this book and, and read it on the nature of scripture. There's also excellent essays on the Trinity here. But he writes, Lorraine Botner, page 17, says the biblical doctrine, the true purpose and function of the prophets and their manner of delivery, the message is clearly set forth in the Lord's words to Moses. <coughs> I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy 18.18 18. Jehovah would speak not so much to the prophets as through them, they were to speak precisely, here it is, the words given them, but no others. I have put my words in thy mouth, the Lord said to Jeremiah, in appointing him a prophet to the nation, Jeremiah 1.9. Identically, the same words were spoken to Isaiah in Isaiah 51, verse 16, 59, 21. And formula, thus says the Lord, is repeated some 80 times in the book of Isaiah alone. Even the false prophet Balaam could speak only that which Jehovah gave him to speak. And the angel of Jehovah said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only, here it is, the word that I speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. Numbers 22, 35, 23, 5, and uh, chapter 23, verse 12, chap Numbers 23, verse 16. So, Classic Protestant process, theology, uh, such as Lorraine Botner, would agree with what I'm saying. So you have Lorraine Botner there, and you have L. Raymond there, who are in the classical reform Protestant stream of how we define scripture. We define it by scripture not by community first, okay? So I'd, encur I'd encourage you, Bob, to engage with the literature that I'm encouraging you to read, and it will profit you and it will help you uh, in this area. So I'm not gonna leave this topic 
alone yet on the definition of scripture because I want to ram this issue home on the nature of scripture um, we have another book here uh, which we'll look at this is a the Westminster Confession of Faith now let's read what the Westminster Confession says Chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession. This is the classical Protestant evangelical statement. One of the finest, if not the finest statement on the doctrine of scripture they've ever written. And I'd encourage every uh, apologist at Hyde Park and you Bob to get hold of a Westminster Confession and study it specifically on this issue of scripture. It says, although in the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom and power of God as to leave men, to leave men unexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that he will, that his will unto his church and afterwards for the better preserving the propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing which maketh the scripture to be most necessary those former ways of God's everlasting his will unto his people being now ceased so here we have reasons why scripture was given it was given for the establishment of the church, for the propagating of the truth, okay, for the comfort of the church. And, and it gives the scripture to back up the statement. So you can read this and you'll find the scriptures in the Westminster Confession are given to back up the statement. It says in Proverbs twenty two nineteen, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, have not I written to these excellent things in counsels of knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou might answer the words. Of truth to them that send unto thee. So the Westminster Confession gives the scriptural basis. There's a number of scriptures there, but I just quoted one that the words of God are inspired. And then it goes in section two Under the name of the Holy Scripture or the Word of God, written are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, which are these, and it quotes all the Old Testament and New Testament. All of which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. The book commonly called Apocrypha not being of divine inspiration and not part of the canon of scripture, therefore of no authority in the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. The authority of Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depended not upon the testimony of any man, or church, but only upon God, who is itself truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. That's 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 the issue here with you, Bob, specifically talking about community. The authority of Scripture for which it ought to be believed, obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church. You went to community first, but wholly upon God, who is its truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. Um, so in our apologetics, in our defense of the faith to Muslims, we don't go straight to community to defend the Bible. We go to the Bible first. We say, this is what the Bible says. 
and the Bible is self-authenticating. Self we can use history and archaeology and any other evidence to back up the Bible. But ultimately, the Bible is itself is self-authenticating. And so we need to, when we're talking about the nature of Scripture, is not to go to community to define Scripture, but we go to the Bible because the Bible is self-authenticating. And this is the key between your apologetic method, specifically on this issue of community, and the classical Protestant position of Scripture is the foundation of our apologetic method. And when I mean Scripture, I, I mean not just the message, but the whole of Scripture is our foundation for our apologetic method. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the Church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture, the heaviness of the matter, the efficiency of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the, the content of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the way of other incomparable, incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof, are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence to be the word of God, yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof, is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. And that is another area in your presentation that you didn't major on in your definition of Scripture because in your definition of Scripture you went to community. You said the Word was created by the community for the community. Mm -mm. The Word was created principally by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit inspired them to write and it was for a specific community it was was, was from a, a redemptive community a community that had been redeemed that was in the covenant and these are issues and terms that you didn't bring in your presentation so it's a covenant community and the scriptures was, in, was inspired, produced by the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that testifies to the words of the message. The Holy Spirit does not work pri just primarily on the message. The Holy Spirit works and testifies to the words which the message is in. And that's what the confession is saying here. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Number six. And uh, we, we a scriptural reference. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, ye the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. So there it is showing you the testimony of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies to our hearts the power that the the that of the, of the word of God. As for me, this is my covenant, Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of, the, out of thy mouth, nor out of thy mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So the Word and the Spirit work together. The Spirit of God and the Word of God are work together. God gives the words via the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but then the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts with the Word that it is the Word of God. And this whole concept was not there in your presentation. You just talked about community. 
and failed to tackle this issue of the Word and Spirit. And this is significant in the issue of saying that it's the, it's the message that's important, not the words, because it fails to see that the Spirit of God only works with the Word of God. Not just the message, but with the Word of God. We've seen that in Isaiah 59, verse 21. Section 6. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, and to which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word, and that our Son circumstances concerning the worship of God and government of the church common to human action and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word which are always to be observed. So here again is the authority of scripture to uh, as a basis for our conduct in, in our doctrine and in our practice but also the importance of the Holy Spirit in understanding the Word of God. And this is important concerning um, the church. This section 6 is critical on the issue of the doctrine of the nature of Scripture, on the preservation of Scripture, and on the, I think, um, just see... On the nature of scripture, formation of scripture, and preservation of scripture. On the nature of scripture, the formation of scripture, and the preservation of scripture. It is absolutely essential um, to, to realise that... I'm just getting a bit tired, I'll just have a drink. So, it says here, Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship and government of the Church common to human action and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word, which are always to be preserved. So here, um, our doctrine and practice is to be via Scripture and the Holy Spirit is to help us to understand the Word of God. Since the Enlightenment, um, academic theology has, has moved away from looking at theology in a biblical and spiritual way and I think that the church has its theology, a biblical theology and a confessional theology but over the last 200 years since the enlightenment academic theology in the academy has drifted ma massively apart from its confessional theological base. It's also drifted apart from the church. So you have to be careful when you're studying a PhD in theology or when you're studying um, an MA or a degree or when you're in the academy you have to be careful and you have to be aware that there has been this separation 
And so there are intellectual tools within academic theology today that are nothing to do with scripture, that are not rooted in scripture. They're not rooted in the presuppositions of scripture. And there's been a departure. There's been a drifting away from the confessional basis, uh, the confessional basis of scripture. There's been a drifting away from the confessional basis of scripture. So, you know, there's a, there's a need to recognize that. So when you're engaged in academic debate and study, uh, when you're engaged in debating Muslims and you're reading, uh, preparing literature, you're, you're reading academic theology, uh, you're in an environment that is a secular environment, environment that has a long history of intellectual tools that have, have not been uh, rooted in good, sound, biblical theology and have moved away from a confessional basis and also a spiritual basis. So, you, so if you read books that are written by theologians, if you read books that are written by theologians um, and these theologians um, popularize their ideas in these books, you need to realize that these academics are not really coming at it from a spiritual point of view. They're not really coming at it from a theological point of view. Even the best theologians, best academics, such as uh, such as um, I'm going to uh, just stop for a break in a minute um, and carry on the video. Even people like Bruce Metzer. Even people like F.F. F. Bruce, great scholars, mighty scholars. But because they're operating in a secular environment, they, had to, they have to take on, unwittingly, secular presuppositions. And so, for example, a great scholar like uh, Bruce Metzer, um, because uh, modern academic scholarship, for example, takes a certain particular position on the quotations of the early church fathers. Because of the weight of scholarship and the weight of academia on that particular issue, if you're going to want to be a top scholar, you've got to play the game. And so he gave, he, he kind of mediated and came to a, a conclusion about the quotations of the early church fathers that was in line with modern academia because it's it, to go against modern academia would be intellectual suicide so what i'm saying is is that when you're we, we need to realize we need to stick to our theological foundation we need to realize that the church with its biblical theology has authority not the university and the university has taken authority and so a lot of these ideas about it's the words that are important it's the message that's important but not the words they're not coming from the Bible they're coming from academic theology that's cut itself off from the church primarily and cut itself off from uh, its confessional theological base and that's where the issue is and that's where the problem is so we're going to just stop here for a minute and have a break and carry on this video. God bless you.